All righty. My name is Joe Bender. Uh, some of you may know me as Stormgren, and this is Surviving a Network Upgrade. Um, it's my presentation for Nauticon, so be kind. Uh, I'm going to try to leave some time for questions in at the end, but uh, let's get us going, I guess. Uh, I have been doing uh, computers, networking, and telecom in various aspects for about 10, 15 years. Uh, worked for an insurance brokerage for eight of those, and then decide, screw this, making money for other people, I'm going to go start my own consulting practice, doing a lot of this stuff. And one of the reasons for that, one of the reasons for this talk is, is that as I've been going, I found a lot of people who know TCP IP, they know, you know, Ethernet inside and out, but, you know, they come in, and I get brought in, and this is where I make some of my paycheck, is past the point of the router, they don't know what to do. Um, they don't know, I mean, they know what a T1 is, but they don't know how it's hooked up, they don't know where it's going, they don't know how to deal with the vendor, they don't know what to ask for. A lot of people get taken by this. Um, but first and foremost, the number one issue that uh, a lot of people run into, especially when dealing with their management, they'll be given this thing saying, the network's too slow, the network's too slow, we need to go do something about it. Well, it's, it's all well and good. Um, the problem is, is that a lot of people just see that as, oh, we need to, to, to bump up the speed. That's fine. I'll sell, you know, telcos will sell you anything that all day long that will uh, but it, uh, that'll uh, increase the, your actual bandwidth, but you may have other bottlenecks. So my, my point with, with doing any of this, before you get into any you know, upgrades you know, to survive, is understand the problem you're trying to solve. Understand where, um, where you're coming from, where you need to get to, and what the problems are. If, if, if there's an, a really good example of this is I had a site that had um, application that was dragging that happened to be an internet accessible app and, and they kept saying they want a T1 upgrade, they want a T1 upgrade and add another one. Turns out it wasn't the application at all, it was the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it wasn't the application at all, it was the, uh, or the um, network at all, it was the application. The application was, was doing nothing, it was poorly written code. Um, their T1 was virtually unused. So assuming that you've gotten through this stage and you figured out that hey, you know, we really do need more bandwidth, or we do need to add these sites, or we've got this problem. Um, start putting together a list of notes of what you need to do. Oh, am I, am, I, am I being too quiet? All right, so assuming you've got this problem, you know, you, 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 the, you need to go to a vendor. Well, you need to know what to ask them, otherwise they're going to try to sell you something, and that's something they're going to sell you. It's probably not what you want, but it's going to make them a lot of money. Um, I do a lot of this, uh, and a lot of times I find myself, it's like, oh, I'm talking them out of a sale. And, and what it is is you need, to, you need to put together exactly what you want. Do some research. Google is your friend. Um, throw some, you know, there's a, a website that I ran across recently actually doing, looking up some terms for this um, to, to make sure I was going to give the right ones. It's bandwidth.com. It's the Bandipedia. Uh, great, great, great reference. Um, covers a lot of things that you would need to know. Um, so, you put down your requirements. You say, you say, I need this at this site, at these addresses. You put it all together and say, give me a proposal. This is, this is a traditional RFP. You get into doing RFPs, but you should do one. Um, and, and send it out to two or three companies. Now, and notice I'm saying two or three companies. Don't just find one source, the whoever you're currently using. There's no reason you necessarily need to stay with them in this day and age, um, especially with the amount of money that they will charge you for, on new stuff. Let them know you're talking to other companies. Any company you talk to, let them know that you're talking to other companies. Um, this tends to do really interesting things to the pricing, um, to the point where I had, at my last job, we had a bid between Sprint and a certain three-letter telco that shifted names about three times in the last six years. And um, it looked like we were going with them, but it looked like we were going with Sprint, because that's who we'd been with. Um, until we happened to mention this to the other carrier, then you gotta play them off against each other. And immediately, as soon as we did that, price dropped by half. They will do this. It is a cutthroat market. Um, just as a small note, I do resell 
uh, services for small CLEC in Michigan. So if you're interested, shameless plug here. Um, but no, seriously, these guys are, these guys will charge you for everything they can charge you. Freebies are there, just like with your, if you've argued with Sprint or Verizon or T-Mobile about getting something off your bill or getting free text messaging, a lot of times you can get freebies out of these guys, especially when they screw up, um, which will happen. Because there's, there's almost two inevitable truths here um, when dealing with, with, with upgrades and dealing with new orders and new everything and, and new, new services. The first is telcos lie. They will lie to you as long as the sun's up or the sun is down. They will sit there and promise you ridiculous things, um, including um, things they can't even provide to you. Um, good case in point, same upgrade with the three letter, former three-letter telco. They went and said, and this is going to get another point in a minute here, they were promising us a T3 within three weeks of contract sign. <laughs> now, anybody's ever put in a T3, which is a circuit provision over coax and usually requires fairly expensive facilities to deliver, knows that this is, even if the facilities are in the building, it is not something easily done unless you pay for it. And don't correct them on this. Say, oh, there's no way you can do that. Let them promise that to you and let them put it in writing. Because this is what happened. Um, and this is also my other point is know what your facilities are locally and at any place you're putting in service. Know what they are because that, that can be proved to be the advantage. Uh, in this case, all teams are provided all over fiber these days. You don't see one in a building that's on copper. I mean, it's handed off to you on copper, but it has to come in on fiber provided into the building. Um, we didn't have that. They were saying, at this building, we're going to give you one in three weeks. Well, we let this play out in three weeks, and they rejected it, saying, oh, well, AT&T says they can't do it, so it's not our fault. Well, yes, it is. He provided it in three weeks. And this is the point where you, you, you take your shoe off metaphorically, beat it on the table, and say, give me something for this. Well, while they were finishing up building out the fiber, I ended up with eight T1s free, providing this bandwidth for the next three months. So they, the, the thing to remember is, and they, they will try to do this to you, is beat on you mercilessly and make you feel guilty for every single thing you ask for. You have to remember that, you're, that you are their customer, not the other way around. You're paying them money for a good service. Um, and you get a lot of concessions, especially if you're in the middle of the implementation phases of an upgrade project or any kind of project. If you're implementing it and you're only halfway through and they're, they're not missing their dates, they're, mi they're not doing what they want to, get really loud and indignant and angry. They listen to this. Um, a couple of points, but that, like I said, going back to my other point, understand, you know, in terms of a lot of, a lot of problems that I see is people not understanding where they are. And that is your network should be fully documented. Every site that's getting something new, you should know about. You should know where they're physically located. If they're in another state, the best thing I ever did, I mailed a disposable camera to every single state that I was doing, that we were changing over circuits. And I said, take, see if you can get, get pictures of your phone closet for me, get pictures of where the phones come in, the DMARC, get pictures of your server room, and then mail them back to me. Then we had the Department of Administrative Assistant go out and develop them, and I could see it everywhere we were going and say, oh, wait, I don't see any more wiring here. I don't see, I don't see certain things. So then we could, when I had contractors at the sites, I could, I could say with knowledge, having never been there, what needed to be done. So, and then, and then <clears throat> excuse me. And it also, do this weeks ahead of time. You should have your game plans nailed down long before any contractor or any provider actually sets foot into your building if you can help it. Um, again, most projects that I get pulled into or come in on are because people don't think ahead. They said, oh, we're just going to do that, put this in, do this, plug it in, and we'll be done. It's not how it goes, um, especially if you have to order something. Um, happens a lot. Um, it's like, oh, wait, we can't change out this card, or this card isn't, isn't capable of interfacing with what we thought we were. You know, if you don't know what your equipment is, you can't go forward either. But like I said, a lot of it is just really, really common sense stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. A couple things you should generally know when you're ordering in a new circuit or terminating something. They will, um, 
And this is especially true in going through competitive carriers. And another thing about competitive carriers, especially large ones, um, small ones, it's easily, it's usually just one guy who's doing all of this stuff. And in fact, there's one sitting in the back of the room right now. Um, hi, Paul. Uh, the large ones, it's a little bit different, especially when you're dealing with somebody like Sprint or MCI. Or I'm sorry, Verizon or Verizon Business, whatever they're deciding to call themselves this week. Um, these guys t got as large as they did because they tend to absorb companies. And this means there's a lot of miscommunication on their end. What you will typically have happen when you order a circuit, you'll have your local account rep, you'll have a local account technical person who's supposed to be baton waving the actual orders and putting it through their internal ordering systems, which by the way, if, true, if, if I understand it and having seen some screenshots, they suck as bad as you think they do. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of divisions in the back end that they really don't tell you about. And then eventually you also have to deal with the local phone company if it doesn't happen to be them. Um, I also don't recommend generally going through your large local carrier for a lot of this stuff. They tend to, again, they tend to try to treat it as one-stop shopping and they're even worse to get information out of. Um, but what will typically happen is, is you'll get something back saying, you'll get something known as a FOC date back, which stands for firm order commitment. And what that means is, and that has absolutely nothing to do with the carrier you just ordered a circuit from. This has everything to do with the local telco, hopefully has a clue. Um, that's when they're meeting, they're going to be able to get that circuit delivered. Um, or if they're going to reject it due to what they call facilities issues, usually because there's something that's not there, they, they claim they can't do it. That date does not mean that's when your circuit's going to be ready. That just means that there's, hey, there's, there's probably going to be a T1 here around this date, and uh, we're going to hand it over at about that point. And occasionally what will happen is, is that date will get mangled somewhere along the way. As I said, you know, they, they, the large carriers tend to have several divisions. And you've usually got a local level division who actually places the order. You've got a mid-level division that actually, uh, you have a mid-level division that goes and configures the circuit to the routers. The router configuration people and then the turn up people who may or may not be A, your local contact or B, that router team. Or C, a third party entirely. Um, a lot of times things will get messed up internally should be providing back to you is when that local loop is going to be delivered by the LEC. They, they get this date back from them. If they can't provide it, you should be running screaming because that's a basic piece of information. The date that they expect to have their work done. And then the date that you schedule and you pick this, don't let them shove it down your throats. They will try to do this and make it, make it convenient for them, not for you. The date that you're actually going to turn the circuit up. The other thing that's important to this is that they're also going to start billing you the day that you've scheduled the circuit turn up if it completes. Most contracts are written this way. Don't let them try to bill you before you're ready to turn the circuit up. Um, this, but you'll notice that all these little interconnected divisions, this is where stuff breaks. And the problem is, is you've got this big monolithic entity known as Verizon or this big monolithic entity known as Sprint. And... When in, you know, and that's the way they, they want you to see it, when in actuality has, it's the furthest possible thing from the truth. Um, so get to know how the companies split up internally, especially if you're doing a large project. Um, learn their lingo. Um, this has gotten me miles and miles. It's, 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 it's a little bit of social engineering. It's a little bit of just knowing you know, what, your, what environment you're dealing with is. Um, technologies that, so, and I could probably spend another six or 20 minutes on this. But a couple of things, uh, other points that I wanted to get. Um, most places, and they're getting really stingy as cost-cutting measures are going down, is DMARC versus extended DMARC. A lot of people aren't confused on this. DMARC's where the circuit terminates in the building by the LEC, uh, the local exchange carrier, the phone company. It's gonna turn, they're gonna leave it there, and that's where they have, that's the, their last point that they can possibly take a circuit, thanks, thank you, divestiture. Um, now, if you're willing to pay for it, and usually it's cheaper if you have the local carrier do it, uh, I'm taking that back, if you have your, your, your contracted carrier do it versus you know, the company actually providing the copper loop to the DMARC, is an extended DMARC where they extend that circuit all the way to your, the location you want them to. 
And this is actually the stickiest part about this, and this is where I spend most of my time just, just trying to get them to put, literally put a jack where I want it. And this usually costs you to do it. Um, if you have local, if, if the price is outrageous, find a local contractor that, that maybe is doing your other site wiring, and that tends to help. Um, the other thing you should be getting back from your carrier, though, always, is where that smart jack, you know, smart jack for anybody who doesn't know, is the uh, semi-intelligent device that sits between you and the, the network. Um, it's usually a little buy, it's usually a little card and a shelf, about yay high, a bunch of red and green lights, you usually want all green. Um, red is bad. This is a good rule. Red is bad, green is good. Um, and that's generally, if you're lucky, they'll drop it right next to your, your stuff. If not, it'll usually be in a closet somewhere in the building. Um, they should be handing you where they actually put the smart jack. This is information that's passed through the food chain. If they say that they can't hand it to you, they're lying through their teeth. Um, the IDs of the actual circuit that's been tagged. And then, of course, you know, you need to nail down your schedules. Um, in terms of technologies these days, there's, there's, really, there, there's really a couple that have popped out that have been kind of exciting that if you need to upgrade to, you should seriously look at doing, especially if you've got multiple sites. Um, one is MPLS or MPLS VPN. Um, I like it a lot. It's the new, one of the newer ones the last few years. It's not full-blown MPLS, and anybody who's not familiar with MPLS, it's uh, multi-protocol label switching. Um, and again, if I munge an acronym, everybody's human, right? Um, MPLS VPN says, okay, I don't have to run this huge cumbersome protocol stack that MPLS is, which it is, and it's could be a little bit um, difficult to implement. What that it basically is, is it gives you this, this uh, internet-like setup, but it's all private. Um, it beats frame relay out because you don't have the overhead, and it's all based on routing protocols. Most of the large carriers are implementing it these days. They all do it slightly differently, but most of them are based around a Cisco product. You essentially announce a routing protocol back up at them, and almost automatically connects everything together, all your networks together. Um, it's a really good technology. Um, I've had a lot of success implementing um, from three to 10 sites with it, or three to 30 sites with it. And um, it's very cost effective for what it does. It's, and it, and it, is, it should be cheaper than an internet circuit in general. Um, a lot of other things that are and our standard internet VPN is really good, except for not being able to really do QoS just yet, unless you're keeping it all on your provider's network. Um, the other thing you should be looking at, especially if you've got a small thing or you've got a bunch of sites regionally, um, and you really need the speed, is Metro Ethernet. That's really been, I've been seeing a lot of products come out lately that are addressing um, the Ethernet, or addressing things via Ethernet, and it's really, um, really trivially easy to implement. You don't have to get into really expensive cards to do it, um, for, or routers. You just basically need a router with two Ethernet interfaces or even a Linux box and you're done um, for a lot of this stuff. A um, couple of things you should probably stay away from, at least in my opinion. And again, the, a lot of this stuff is just based on experience. ATM is one of them, unless you need to be running OC3 or you know optical sonnet, OC3, OC12 type stuff. Um, though if you're doing that, you probably, I'm wondering why you're actually sitting in this talk, because you probably know a little bit more about some of this than I do. Um, the other one is frame relay. Frame relay is a pain in the butt. It's overpriced. It's expensive. Well, that's redundant. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's a dying technology. It, it's, it's a, with the advent of the MPLS VPN stuff and MPLS in general and the internet being so ubiquitous, Frame Relay's kind of got its niche applications. And I'm not going to say it doesn't have its uses, but if you're just trying to link offices together, there are much better, cheaper ways of doing it. Anybody who's telling you that, that Frame Relay is the way to go and that you know, everything else needs to be ignored, you should probably not be seriously considering whether the business that they're, that they're trying to sell you. Um. <clears throat> One of the other things I, I kind of run into, especially, and I, I do focus a lot, a lot of uh, more and more bandwidth issues, because really people do need a lot of bandwidth and we're consuming, we're doing a lot of circuit installations day in and day out where people are just needing the raw speed. 
A uh, couple of misconceptions I want to clear up. One, the jump from T1 is not T3. It's multiple T1s. Um, you can do, it is now possible to do, even though some people will try to say, hey, you can't do that, you need to go to T3. Um, you can bond up to generally eight T1s together. Um, and most providers will regrettably sell you these. They don't make these facts terribly clear. Um, the only one I could think of is Verizon, but that was on the old MCI page. Um, the other one is, especially with internet circuits, is BGP for multi-homing. BGP is not a load balancing solution. Um, BGP being border gateway protocol, of course, and a lot of times I'll see um, one of my current clients it does ISP-like functions, and I got a call from somebody saying, oh yeah, by the way, um, we need to start running BGP against you guys because we just bought another circuit for bandwidth. Okay, well you didn't buy it from us. Well, yeah, but you know, we needed the extra bandwidth, so we got, another, we got the redundancy in the provider. Well, all that's going to do is that yes, it may help. Um, but what's going to all that's going to do is be providing a redundant internet connection, and I do see that a lot. Usually, if you want the if you want the redundancy, you go BGP and you go with two circuits from two different carriers. If you want more more than one pipe, or if you want a faster pipe, you just add another one and link them together. Um, so just in case I'm not elaborating on something, does anybody have any questions at the moment? Okay then, moving right along. Um, a couple other things, you know, again, common sense things when I've been doing circuit turnups and circuit upgrades. Uh, when you're in the middle of an implementation and you're turning up something, especially at a remote site, um, anybody here is familiar with Cisco and copy running config, startup config, or write memory. During the middle of an implementation, this is your worst enemy. Um, reason being is, is that if you need a fallback plan, especially if you're moving from, from one thing to another and you don't have an easy way to fall back, especially if you lose communications, if you're writing your config out as you're going, of course, you know, again, it's Cisco 101, you're going to end up getting yourself into a jam one of these days. Um, where, and yes, I have done this. Um, and there's nothing worse than walking a local tech um, who doesn't really know Cisco, but he does have a console cable to uh, start editing config commands um, at 9 o'clock at night. Another thing is, is, is know exactly what you're getting. Uh, another case in point, uh, we are, we were, at my current client, we're switching from one provider to another. I came into the project a little late and he said, oh yeah, here's these five circuits on this channelized DS3. And thinking nothing of it, went ahead and started doing it until we got about to the fifth or sixth circuit and realized that well, we've got actually got two channelized DS3s in here. Nobody's told me about it, and um, these circuits are actually over here on the wrong router. Um, that result was, was that you know it added another two weeks of downtime. So again, know where you're getting to. Um, and along the lines of having local techs out there, especially if you're not on site and you've hired somebody to come out and do something for you, um, temporary local passwords. I'm aware of one, play, one um, company that got into trouble because it turns out that all of their routers, including their master router, all had the same password and they gave one to a visiting field tech. Um, so if you can set up temporary passwords before you do an upgrade, before you get yourself into a jam, it's, it's a really good thing to have. Um, works out fairly well. <coughs> I lost my... Oh. Apologize, I kind of got out of sync here. When you're setting down these project schedules, or when you're trying to schedule a lot of, uh, dealing with a lot of um, things going on at once, and again, case in point, my, my last company where we did a 30 site upgrade. They're going to try to push you into doing this as fast as possible, and by them I mean your management generally. Unless you are your management, in which case you're really lucky. 
when you're doing this, always give yourself enough time for fallback and redo because most of the time, um, I, I, and I'll hazard to say that for some reason, especially the things you can't control, you're going to end up falling back or delaying a lot of the time, especially with missed dates. Um, and have this stuff documented. Um, it's kind of a management 101 thing, but they like seeing pretty pictures and they like seeing that you're actually producing something even if it's only paper. Um, and it's also be able to good to go back to, and again, that whole beating your shoe on the desk and getting the vendor's attention saying, well, you said on this date, this date, and this date, and I wrote this down, you're, all go you're going to be able to do this for me. If you don't have this stuff written down, you're, it's ne they're never going to be able to, you're never going to be able to prove it, you're never going to keep track of it. It's <clears throat> generally just one of those things. <sighs> Fortunately, I seem to be getting ahead of myself here. And again, any other questions at this point? Um, you might do this sometimes. Uh, in, in smaller businesses, you would run into it as much as you have a keyboard and you're a mail server. Okay. But, and in a bigger IT setup, do you recommend that they go out to uh, Aaron's or own IP addresses instead of, you know, you go to Quest or Sprint or something to get a link? Uh, I mean, should you try and get your own IP addresses that way when you need a different link? You know, you take your different link and okay. it's not as big of a move. I mean, DNS has improved, but. Well, and actually the, the bigger question is, it's actually a very valid point. And, and in, in that, apparently, are people, can people hear me okay? Seems to be, is this any better? There. All right, so the question was, you know, should you go out and get your own IP space if you're a larger ISP or not? And, and you can get, and one thing Aaron's policies are is, is uh, if you read them closely, you can, you're only supposed to re request private space or public space in your own block if you can get a, a 23 or larger, I believe. Uh, maybe down to a 22 or 21 now. The... <clears throat> There are exceptions. You can get as small as a 24 from them if you need it, um, especially if you're going to be multi-homed. And the reason you're going to want your own IP space, especially the ISP, is so it's completely independent. You should be getting, you should be getting this anytime you're considering going multi-homed. Um, you should also have, if you're also an ISP of any size, you should also be having multiple uplinks back to the net. And the minute you get, to, and because what you don't want to do as an ISP, especially if you're a smaller ISP or regional ISP, is to be getting into problems where if you're up, if you're getting all of your IP space from one of your upstream carriers, and that relationship goes south or goes sour, and it will, especially if they move into your local territory, and say, hey, we're going to provide local service now, and your DSL provider, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, we're not sure if we want your business, we're going to jack up your rates. You need to be able to switch upstream providers pretty much at will, and that's what that independent space is going to give you, as well as that AS number. Well, anytime you're going to be running publicly multi-homed, you're going to need that AS number, and I think the price right now is like three to $2,500 to $3,000 a year, so um, generally a good idea. Anybody else? Actually, that, that did bring up a bigger thing because I have been addressing smaller offices and, and smaller businesses and whatnot. And one thing, one point that I did want to bring up, because I see this a lot, and to an extent this is true if you've got three people in your business or three people that you're supporting, DSL is a perfectly fine solution. The thing that, that really starts to irritate me is I keep seeing DSL get sold for larger companies, you know, say 30 people. Um, or as a backup solution to a main T1 because it's, you know, it's cheaper. Um, not so much. Usually the DSL problem is the one with the bigger headaches. Um, as much as they try to push business class DSL, it's not really a business class solution because you can't get, you can't generally get SLAs, service level agreements. Things that say, hey, when my circuit goes down, I can call them up and yell at them and have them come out in four hours and do this and fix it. Um, DSL is best effort, meaning eh, we, we can get around to fixing it maybe when we're out there next Thursday if there happens to be a full moon. They might fix it. 
If there's noise on the line, they might fix it. If it randomly drops out, they might fix it. So in this day and age, if, <clears throat> excuse me, in this day and age, if you're going to have problems, it will be on a, a, a DSL line. And as critical as things are in this day and age with, with um, the internet and email being so critical for businesses, you really don't indulge it, don't buy it. It's, it's not worth it. I fix a lot of problems with it. Let's see. One of... <clears throat> Another thing to contemplate when you're doing all of this is is generally money. Um, a lot of times when I go back to management on a, on a, or a, a manager on an issue and say, "Yeah, I need you know forty, fifty thousand dollars worth of gear to do this. I want all new router somewhere." If you're lucky, I'll get it. Uh, if not, what will tend to end up happening is I'll get, well, what's wrong with what we have? We've only bought it six years ago. Unfortunately, depending on where you are, is this uh, this is an all too familiar reality. Um, eBay is your friend. A lot of cheap Cisco gear right now. A lot of um, uh, you got to be careful not to to buy something too incredibly aged. That five dollar deal may turn out to be a nightmare because you can't get a firmware for it or a manual um, or even a password recovery procedure. And I see Paul waving back there, so he's he's all too familiar with it. That is a very good point. Um, and, and yeah, actually, that, that forty dollars or $50,000, a lot of vendors will actually do that. Because, and, and the really funny part is, and I really wish I had a way of tracing this, when you sell, if you sell gear back to your vendor or you trade it in with them, Cisco or whoever, a lot of times that gear will come right back to eBay. It's just this loop. The vendor will give you credits. It doesn't ever actually go back to Cisco, and it just hits eBay. Um, I'm sure there's pieces of gear that haven't been powered on in five years, but have been shipped all over the country. <laughs> um, I'm sorry? Yeah, and I, I have been, I, I, I've seen similar <laughs> things happen, and that's, that's always one thing to look at is, um, another thing that's happened, actually, that this, uh, that this brings up, the carriers themselves have gotten into selling hardware. Um, because the market for services has gotten so very tight, they'll say, oh yeah, you can be a one-stop shop, don't worry about going to CDW, don't worry about going to, you know, favorite local Cisco partner, we'll sell you the router you need and we'll turn it, install it, and everything else. Um, these are really good things to get because these are also sometimes loss leaders. Um, I've gotten router cards for free, again, with the whole, you didn't deliver my DS3 on time, dare you, give me free routers. Sometimes they'll do this. Um, it never hurts to ask. Um, and also use it, you can also drive the price of a router below cost as well because you'll say, well, I'm going to go over to here and, and have this bid out and you guys are trying to sell it to me. And they'll be so desperate to have the thing delivered and to sell it just so they can make sales quotas because nobody actually uses them as hardware vendors a lot of the time. That you'll get stuff almost at cost or slightly below, especially if there's a very expensive service attached to it at the same time. Um, it, it, it works a little bit differently for them because they're dumping inventory rather than giving you service credits. It usually works out in their favor as well, so it's, it's one of the reasons that it happens. Um, another really useless thing um, that I found from them, they're going to try to sell you um, managed services, managing the router, and if you don't have time to do it, this is sometimes well and good to have. Um, however, one thing that I found that is utterly useless is... Um, their proactive management or proactive monitoring. And I've had this happen with several carriers. They're supposed to have it where if the circuit drops, they're supposed to call you. Um, their, their criteria for this is, is nebulous, and I've never gotten a straight answer out of any of them, um, other than possible red alarm or whatever. It doesn't necessarily diagnose a router drop. Um, even when the circuit does drop and die, um, usually, most of the time, I had a, an independent third-party company actually doing this for me for several sites because they were actually contracted to do a lot of the maintenance. 
they were catching stuff that the, just using ping, that the, that the carrier never even saw. Um, and then when you go back to say, well, we, were, we had an availability of 15 minutes, and, and this is unacceptable, and they say, well, we didn't see anything wrong. You're paying for a monitoring service, and our monitoring service didn't find anything. So not only are they charging you money, they're also using it to tell you that there's absolutely nothing wrong with the service that they're providing. Um, it's generally not worth it. I think I've had, I think, out of doing this for 10 years with, with doing managed WANs, I've had it exactly twice that they've called me where it actually, the circuit was actually down and that they were actually proactively doing a dispatch to go fix the problem. Um, and that's with 90 circuits across the country or so. Um, have had them call me lots of times to say that it's down and it wasn't. Um, and as it turns out, they had the monitoring for another customer in the same building messed up with mine. And that customer actually had turned off the service. They were so disgusted with it, as it, as it turns out. So it's, it's, not, a good, it's a not a good way uh, use of money. Um, anytime, they, they, anytime they're telling you they're trying to sell you something to make your life easier, just like anything else in life, they're probably pulling your leg. Um, the other one right now is... Uh, the name of it. It's um, no, unfortunately, it slips my brain. It's it's been a long week for me. Um, and I've got. Unfortunately, I don't do slides, but what I did, did put together is a bunch of notes on this. So. Um, I'm trying to make sure I didn't miss anything because I'm running, I'm actually running a little early on this. Um, Again, I always hate to throw it out there, but any, any other questions at the moment? Okay. Um, yeah, that's on. Oh, yeah. Is this thing on? Okay. Hello. You had mentioned monitoring, um, and monitoring various switches. I mean, is different than monitoring a host. Obviously, is there any kind of, I guess, recommendations? I mean, I, there's so many monitoring solutions out there, but I mean, is there one that, you know, is the best bang for your buck, and then maybe one that, you know, is going to cost you a bit, but is really going to. At, at this point in the in in things, you can pay for managed monitoring. Um, my suggestion, if you know Linux or Unix or something, they're on fresh meat and in um, Debian's repository and any Linux distributions repository. You've got MRTG you, for for bandwidth and, and graphing and monitoring. You've got Smoke Ping. You've got Nagios. There's dozens and dozens of tools. In terms of bang for the buck, find the combination of of, of, of open source tools that work for you and use them. Um, there are a lot of commercial tools that will, that will actually, there's actually a lot of commercial tools and a lot of commercial appliances that all they are is embedded Linux boxes with, um, with some of these tools with really fancy screens that they've paid some graphics designer to do really nice HTML for. That's really the same tools. So go ahead and, and just find something that works for you. And, and every network is slightly different. I had one that all I needed really was MRTG and smoke ping and you know, just to find out, and, and um, some, really some Perl scripts and some shell scripts that all they did once a minute was go out and ping the remote site. If it, did, if it failed to ping twice, that there was probably something wrong, go ahead and send an email out. Um, you know, there, you see these packages that for very large sites, it does make sense, especially they've got automatic detection and discovery to make your life a lot saner and for very, very large sets of, of nodes. Um, that might be worth the money you're, you're, you're going to pay for them. Um, a lot of them just aren't. There's a lot of crap out there. Um, disgustingly large amounts of crap, unfortunately. 
you go through if you go through network computing, most of the stuff I've looked at in the you know that the, I've gotten free demos of and trials of has not proved to be worth the money. Um, just go through freshmeat.net really. Um, and that is true. I've, I've, I've been kind of focusing so far on, on you know, and this is where a lot of the headaches are on the telco side, on the provider side. Um, when you're doing, and again, when, when you're talking about knowing your network, knowing, um, <clears throat> excuse me, knowing your network, knowing, knowing how things are put together, um, nmap-sp for ping scan, just pinging, seeing what's out there. I found so many hosts that other people in, other IT in the rest of the IT department I was working in at the time had put there, and it's like, hey, if I take this link down for five minutes, this box is going to freak out. I didn't know that was there. Um, but yeah, you should, when you're doing documentation, things like NAP and uh, Nessus is, is mostly for security vulnerability scanning, but hey, it's also good for, for host identification too. Um, NMAP's fingerprinting works okay, but you know, things like Nessus and, and uh, Snorb for looking at kinds of traffic that you're looking at, and top um, to know your environment. You know, just, just start digging out there. Google, like I said, initially, Google is your friend. Um, chances are you are not the first person to have this problem. And in, in this community, chances are there's somebody else who's written a tool because they were too ticked off to deal with it anymore and they decided to do something about it. Um, things, a lot of common tools I use, honestly, again, not getting fancy. SSH, Telnet, unfortunately. A lot of Telnet only routing and switching and management devices out there. Um, Another good thing to know is how is, is pinouts. You know, know your RJ45 pinouts for, for T1. Um, know your Cisco console pinouts because occasionally you'll break an end off a cable and need to make a new one so it'll stay attached. Um, things like that. One of the things I carry on me that was I had in my hand earlier that's incredibly useful. Um, Adtran has these, but you can buy these in various places. Um, anybody who's not familiar with it, this is a T1 loopback jack. This is invaluable for, for, you know, especially connectivity issues between the smart jack and your router. You plug it into the cable facing your router or device, CSU, DSU, and it'll usually bring it up and you can, you can get a physical known good loop. Um, I use one of these often enough that I carry one with me on my keychain on a regular basis. Um, also, you know, get, get to know your way around a phone room. Know what a 66 block is, know what a 110 block is. Know what a smart jack shelf looks like if you don't know what a smart jack shelf looks like. Um, that sort of thing. <clears throat> um, another thing is, is that, and again, along the lines of management tools, um, know how the, the low level operating, uh, the low level I, um, operating environment of your, your devices work. If it's ProCurve, know how the ProCurve switch environment works. Um, a lot of times what I'll see is levels of obfuscation pretty much where you'll have a management tool like Tivoli or something really nice or ProCurve switch manager or Cisco works or something like that sitting in front of a router. And I've actually gotten a call from, at, at the, again, at the current client I'm at, um, doing a lot of work for, I got a call from a Cisco admin on another site. The Cisco work system was down. Um, they were in the middle of changing out. Uh, they were in the middle of changing out two circuits. He was freaking out because he couldn't remember how to log in and do this. Um, you know, do, you, it, every so often, give yourself a refresher on on how to go back through and just even configure an interface, get into a router, no iOS, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> More questions, comments, observations? Anybody got any? You mentioned a couple times about documentation. I was just curious about um, at what point do you decide that you should stop documenting to a certain extent because managing that information or you know, getting your head around that information, the amount of time that you're spending collecting that information is no longer worth it. Is there, you know, some guidelines that you use as far as how far down you go? Um, well, it, my thing is, yeah, from my point of view, you can never have too much information. 
Um, this being said, you do have a valid point. There's a ridiculous amount of time spent on, on it's not so much how much information you collect, it's how many times it's replicated. Um, I like to have a consistent set of information across things. One, maybe say spreadsheet for IP addresses or a one management app for IP addresses and DNS information. Um, I saw a place that had it in bind tables, a spreadsheet, and an access database, depending on who was looking at the information. So somebody had to go and enter it in all three places. None of them were tied together. Um, you, really, it it comes down to making sure it's organized efficiently, if that makes sense. Uh, because once you get the once you get it built, I mean, when you come into an environment like again, one of the environments I have dealt with recently had absolutely no information on where they were at. It's an, and they were a fairly large environment. Um, that initial load is absolutely staggering. You'll spend three or four weeks doing that alone. Once it's in place and the the, the structure is efficiently done, it moves, adds, and changes especially if you can delegate it to junior admins, and this is something junior admins are really good for, is, uh, is just saying, hey, go put these five hosts in the table and then go update it and let me sign off on the changes before I do it. Um, if you're the only guy in the shop, you need to make sure that if you get hit by a bus, somebody else can come in and take care of it. That's usually, the, actually, that's the criteria I use. If, if I got, if, if lightning hit me or if the ceiling fell on me right now, how could they go forward on this without, without me being around? Any more questions, observations, comments, personal anecdotes? I had a question about, um, actually two things. One, um, MPLS. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Um, you mentioned MPLS earlier. Um, one of our, our, our needs is um, we've got multiple locations with similar PBX systems. Mm -hmm. that are capable, capable of voice over IP trunking. Yep. Um, so one of the needs that's, that's pushing some things is, is QoS. Yep. Um, currently, we have generally on each location two internet devices or two internet connections um, with Cisco VPN going between them mm -hmm. uh, for connect connectivity. Um, so Quest came back and said that we should do MPLS between all our locations. Do you have a response to that? Does that sound like a, uh, a logical thing to do? It depends on what they're meaning by MPLS. There's, 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 MPLS is a term that's, that refers to something very specific, but when a carrier comes back and says, we'll do an MPLS circuit, it means one of two things. We're either going to give you a raw thing, which you're actually going to speak the actual MPLS protocol to us, um, which is actually fairly complicated. Um, but you could do really nifty um, classes of services with it. The other one is MPLS VPN, which is actually a bit more common for most end sites. Um, and what that is, is you'll have, it'll be a TCP link between your router and their edge. And you'll be speaking, and let's say you've got, I'm assuming you're using private addresses between your sites right now. And what you'll have on one side is you'll be announcing using, believe it or not, RIP, V2, or private BGP between your router and them. It'll be speaking um, to announce the routes back in. And that's the more common implementation, and really the one you should be aiming for because it's really dead stupid easy to administer. It is once you gear, get your, you don't even have to go out and get an AS. It uses a private BGP autonomous system number, um, and there's a reserved range at the top of it to do that. And it's, it's really easy to administer because you just add a new network or VLAN on one side, and as long as it pushes through your routing tables onto the other, boom, it's done. What you can do, though, with this um, is because all, the ed, the, all their edge routers do all the heavy lifting for you. You can QoS your traffic using diff serve or just using standard QoS bits. And it will, they, will, they will prioritize that to usually one of four levels. Uh, I believe how Cisco, Juniper, and Marconi are currently doing this. And so you can, and, and like some of them will have a super secret fifth level for like international latency, though the numbers that Verizon for Verizon Business was publishing for doing like latency between New York and London over their international network, if you buy their, their $75, $100 per circuit a month uh, thing, basically violates the laws of physics because they're claiming a latency lower than the speed of light will allow. <laughs> they, they, they will, again, this is where they will, 
massively promise you lots and lots of stuff um, that they really actually can't do, um, even if they were employing Scotty. But no, seriously, it, it, it actually worked. We, we did that we, with the MPLS VPN because we're doing exactly that at, the, at one site or at one company with 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 point to point VoIP trunking between PBXs. We were on a frame relay network, and let me tell you, even though that frame relay network theoretically respected diff serving and certain QoSing, it was a nightmare. The overhead just made the the call sound like a really bad analog cell phone, um, which was impressive given it's a, na a naturally digital medium. Um, when we had switched over and were doing actual QoS and prioritizing the traffic on the links, it was a night and day difference. It works out really well. And again, anytime you're going from a VPN type scenario to a private WAN type scenario, your, your things like VoIP or more real time things, the latency is going to get better. Um, just because routing traffic over the public internet via multiple providers is, you can never tell how your packets are going to get there. So yeah. Um, unofficially, or officially, that, that sounds like a really good way to go. Unofficially, again, shop around. As, I mean, if you, if you guys can get, again, these guys are cutthroat. They will beat each other up bloody if they get any hint that you might be willing to jump ship. Go talk to another, go get your options together along those lines before you go forward. Um, the other thing I wanted to, okay. the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, as I get more into the business aspect of it. These microphones. <laughs> the, as I get more now? into the business aspect of it, I, I'm getting more involved in the contract um, yes. aspect of the, of the, okay. of the uh, adding of lines, mm -hmm. changing of lines, things like that. Um, recently, we've, um, with some other hosting services, we're getting pretty much screwed on multi-year contracts. Um, we're with a hosting company right now. Mm -hmm. The management before us signed a four-year contract for, for hosting. Um, turns out that hosting service sucks. So we're in our third, our, first, our second year. We want to transfer. We're going to get hit with a whole bunch of stuff. So um, currently, with they want to put us on two-year, three-year contracts. Management is like, no, not going to happen. No, no more than first year, one-year contracts. Are, you, are we seeing more people going to multi-year contracts or people going back to one-year contracts, or what are you seeing? Um, well, just for example, the CLEC that I resell for in Michigan, base on a T1, base contract on a T1 is three years. Um, and that trend has been going up. It used to be when it was even, even before the tech crash happened, it used to be that you, would, you could even get a six-month contract if you wanted it. Um, the last place I was at, against my advice and my manager's advice, they went with a five-year. They got a lot of really nifty perks out of it, like uh, a fiber node dropped off in our data center that we could pull whatever we wanted to off of it. If, but it was, it was captive. It was theirs. And it wasn't even the CLEX, it, or it wasn't even, the, um, I'm sorry, the ILEC, um, AT&T. It belonged to Verizon Business. So it's not like we could get access through anybody else on that node. But hey, we got some really nifty stuff out of them, but it was a five-year contract and a certain amount of dollar commit per year. The thing to remember is, with those multi-year contracts, is if you're going to do a contract that long, they will negotiate it. They will say, oh, well, here's a contract. And this is true of the big guys. You can say, okay, well, fine. I'm going to give you, if you want me to give you money for five years, this is what I want. And, you know, this is where lawyers are helpful, <laughs> seriously. Have them translate your demands into legalese, especially, like, ways of getting out of the contract. Like, if, if certain things aren't delivered, and again, this is where documentation comes into play. Every time they violate it, just start keeping track. And then when they come in to say, hey, when next time your account reps in and say, hey, how things are going, slide under their nose and say, well, you know, we've been talking to our lawyers, and the fact that we've been down five times in the last week means that we can go ahead and terminate the service. It really is silly and stupid, but you have to realize they don't care about you. So anything that you can do to, again, turn the thumbscrews down on them is the best way to go. Um, contracts are a whole, pretty much a whole different talk. I mean, I could, there's, there's, there's something I've been working on to basically be, you know, this is how you do, this is how you do a services contract, and it's, 
it's a good thing to know. It's a good thing to be looking at, and that's actually a good valid point that you know. I notice I've, I've got about two minutes here. Um, is don't just know the technical aspect of it. Get involved in the business. This is, it's just as important, especially if, if, if you do find yourself in managing a whole network. It is something that you can't afford to be ignorant about. So the fact that you're picking it up is, is, is a really good thing. I think I've got time for one more here. Or Um, Hello. Uh, my job title doesn't involve being involved in the network, but you, I remember you mentioned that you had some jobs of yours that turned into a nightmare. Is there anybody, any way somebody who's technical but not into networking can think ahead and specify things to make it less of a nightmare for you? I mean, what things should we be considering? Actually, that's a really good point. Um, it's one thing to say the network is slow, but again, specific details. You know, saying, hey, when we go ahead and try to FTP something across to this host, or we're doing this data interchange uh, from here to there, you know, this is, this is really not what's going well. Or we've got this application coming down the road, like if you're, if you're a server admin or your application developer saying, hey, we're going to be shoving, you know, 10 meg TIFF files across, the, across to, you know, London every day. Um, and we're going to do like 300,000 of them. You know, then, then, they can, then we can come back and go, you've got to be out of your mind. Or, hey, this is what we can do. Or, hey, why don't we look at bumping this up, but can you do this to the application protocol? So when you've got something new coming out, blind, and this is, this is true in general, blindsiding your network admin is usually a really bad idea. They tend to get really cranky and start turning off ports. <laughs> um, Worst case scenario, you may find that your server's been moved. It's, p it's pingable, but you don't know where it went. <laughs> so, but yes, actually, very good point. The more you get people involved in the loop and you do a full set of specs, and especially if you can, especially, if you, you know, the one thing I love hearing is a ticket coming in from a, is saying, hey, we just deployed this thing and it broke, um, is, hey, we're going to deploy this thing. This is what we need or we think we need. Can you help us out? That's, that's really, that really helps. And because uh, you know what they say, knowing is half the battle. Thank you. Thank you.